space is the ultimate nothing. But even though this is the big empty, it doesn't mean there is nothing in it. Even out here, there is one hydrogen atom, one lonely atom for every cubic centimeter of space. And that means if you were going fast enough, you would still have to deal with all this matter, though little it may be. It puts a speed limit on a spaceship like this, because if you were to go at, say, near light speed, hitting all those lonely hydrogen atoms, you would be irradiated to death in less than a second. But, but hey, what do I know? I'm just a guy in a jumpsuit on a spaceship. <laughs> and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes here, yes, on a spaceship. It's the companion show to Because Science where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and weird comments about my hair and face and address them directly. I also tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, I choose you. But more on that later. Also, how did you like that special surprise video from the largest laser facility in the world? Pretty cool, right? I will not be addressing that on this edition of Footnotes, but the next one. So go leave your nerdiest comments there and we will get to them, I promise. Now, you also may have noticed that this is not my normal set. No, the void has permitted me to venture out into some region of unexplored space. You can see even more of this area and all the stories that happen within, all the twists and all the turns in a show called Orbital Redux, which you can watch on Alpha, which is Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's premium subscription service. Now, I know what you're thinking. Another thing I have to subscribe to? Look, I get it, but this show is special. It is a 10 camera sci-fi opera that happens all in this area, which as you can see, looks amazing. And it is live and interactive. It is unlike anything I've ever seen, and the finale is this week. So if you want to check it out, which I highly recommend, subscribe to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com. If you do that, you can even get this show on this channel two days earlier than anyone else. How amazing would that be? But back to science. On the last episode of Because Science, we were going through one of the most famous comic book deaths of all time, the night Gwen Stacy died. Now, I said that if you evaluated that unfortunate set of circumstances from a real engineering perspective and used real spider silk, the conditions are such that Gwen Stacy could have survived. The web could have been stretchy enough that the deceleration would not have snapped her neck. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Shannon Azul, who says, Kyle, it may not have broken her neck, but what about the blood in her body being that quickly forced to her head? What might have happened? Well, interestingly, when blood is forced to your head, if you are decelerating eyeballs up, as they call it, you might experience a red out instead of a blackout. Now, a red out happens because as blood is being forced into your head, it fills your lower eyelids, which are pulled into your field of vision by your increasing eyelid weight. And that happens when you're decelerating eyeballs up. And when that gets pulled into your field of vision, you see a reddish tint to your vision called a red out. Now, there's also other problems. When blood pools in your brain, you can die. But in Gwen Stacy's case, because she is only decelerating under six Gs for less than a second, I checked. I think she would still be fine. I like having multiple cameras. Like, Meet me at camera three. Our next comment comes from Dustin Markley, who says, because science has become a nightly activity for my son Chris and I, not sure how many times he has requested just one more video before bed. For being seven, he has a profound interest in everything you say. A shout out to him in the next footnotes would make his year and some advice on continuing his studies. You got it. Thank you, Justin. That is very sweet of you to say, uh, hey, Chris, your dad wanted me to shout you out in this video. Hey, Chris! You the man! And also give you some advice on continuing your studies. Now, I would not say what you should study. Obviously, I'm biased. I like science and engineering and stuff that can make spaceships. But whatever you are passionate about, that's what I would suggest you put your energy into. When I was your age, I wanted to be a marine biologist. But look at me now, trapped somewhere 
far flung from the Milky Way galaxy. But no matter what you want to be, a marine biologist, a firefighter, a policeman, a doctor, anything, as long as you are passionate about it and you are serious in your pursuit of it, I believe that you absolutely can do it. Our next comment comes from Dante Williams, who says, if you assume the fetal position in space and violently fart, would you spin in place like Sonic the Hedgehog? <laughs> uh, yes. If you are letting off mass from your butt in the form of a fart, it's not that much mass, so you're not gonna change your velocity according to the conservation of momentum all that much. Also, you would want to orient yourself in the fetal position such that you don't want your butt aligned with the center of mass, otherwise you're just going up. If it's not aligned, you get a rotational force and you would spin, yes, like Sonic, but very slowly. And also like Sonic, you would be blue because you'd be suffocating to death. Our next comment comes from Elliot Hochberg, who says, um, whenever I see something in a story that doesn't quite work, I always hand wave and say, well, the story needs to happen, so I'll just pretend the writers got it right and move on. With that in mind, and knowing that you've accepted and posited that maybe there the was torque that snapped Gwen's neck, if the writer of this story had come to you asking how to justify Spider-Man's inability to save her, what would you have told them? Well, that's actually very interesting. Okay, assuming that Gwen Stacy's death is canon and it has to happen, how would you make it more sciency in a way that I couldn't debunk? Well, if I was Green Goblin, I would probably take Gwen out on the Goblin Glider? whatever it's called, out into the middle of the bay, above the ocean where there isn't anything that Spider-Man could web onto. If you dropped her from the glider over the ocean, then at the very least, Spider-Man would have to attach a web to a nearby bridge, which would send her on a pivot trajectory, which would be bad, which we will get to, or Spider-Man wouldn't be able to web anything at all in the nearby area and she would inevitably hit the water and have a fatal acceleration. That's what I would do. It's kind of dark. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode in this spaceship, I gotta give to Jamila Seawright, who says, kinda related rant incoming uh, about Spider-Man. I happen to work for the subway in New York City, so I hate, hate, hate seeing Spider-Man in nearly, nearly all of his media incarnations, having to, having to, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, I got it, having to, it's cool. Great, having to stop a runaway train. There's no such thing. There are a number of safety measures in place to prevent such a thing. The short version is that there are not one, but two dead man switches on each car, plus a way to activate it from inside and outside the train from the tracks. So should every single brake fail, you can do all those dead man switches and, uh, and somehow fail on the train itself. You can still do it. So sorry for the long rant. <sighs> You heard it here. Even though I'm probably gonna do the Spider-Man stopping a train episode, there's not really such thing as a runaway train as Jamila is pointing out. There are a number of fail safes and every single thing would have to go wrong for it to be a true runaway train that you'd have to web up. And for that insight, Jamila, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> But of course, I'm not always right. I recently confused Yadawatts with Zadawatts. <laughs> you know that that's not a thing. So what did I get wrong this week? Now, our first correction comes from a lot of people, but they are all saying the same thing. If spider silk can stretch so much, up to 40% of its original length, in a way that could save Gwen Stacy by increasing the amount of time it takes for her to slow down, how would Spider-Man swing around a city? How would he web up bad guys and objects if Spider-Silk stretches that much? Wouldn't it be kind of not very useful? Well, let's go back to that stress versus strain curve that I mentioned. Spider silk can absorb a lot of energy before it breaks. That means if the spider silk is stretching, it is absorbing a lot of energy. Now consider how much energy you are putting into spider silk depending on its use. If you are just webbing up one bad guy like this, they would have to struggle against it, which isn't providing a whole lot of force on the web. It's not gonna stretch as much under that small stress. Not as much strain for a little stress. That's why the graph looks the way it does. It's almost linear. So if Spider-Man was even swinging around the city, if you have something that is pencil size thick, a line of web, 
That can handle a lot of energy before it starts straining or stretching. So I think there is a way that this spider silk scenario still works. It would stretch so much under Gwen Stacy's load because she weighs technically six times more than her current weight as she is decelerating. And that's why it stretches. So I think even with regular old spider silk, we're still all right. Our next correction comes from Rocco Spaz 86 who says, basically, it looks like Gwen Stacy is kind of pushed out from the tower before she is caught, which means there is some lateral motion as well as vertical motion. And if that's the case, if Spider-Man webs her, she will have to be caught in an arc. And wouldn't that arc force her into the tower to smack her head against it? Well, to me, the panels look straight up and down, so that's what I considered. Yes, I am kind of giving all of the comic book panels here the benefit of the doubt, but given that we didn't see her swing in an arc at all, the comic book artist easily could have done that. I think it is a straight up and down scenario, but you are right, and you mentioned rock climbing. This has happened to me. If you have even a little bit of lateral motion as you fall, you will smack into the wall, because you have a pivot point high above you that you will use and swing into the wall. I took a 20 foot fall on a rope from a pivot point that was about 60 feet off the ground and my belayer was pulled upwards and then I slammed into him. So yes, it's a very dangerous situation, but I'm not sure it exactly matches what we see in the death of Gwen Stacy. Nate, I think this is the best I've ever done in a vlog. I think it's because I don't want to waste all these great people's time. Our next correction comes from Robin Rumeda, who says, uh, also, I would argue that Spider-Man's web shooters don't really shoot spider silk. It clearly has different properties. As example, spider man silk seems to barely stretch at all. So I'd say his silk is more like a simple rope, but stronger. Very technical. However, not more stretchable, just stronger. So a lot of you mentioned this, that Spider-Man probably isn't using straight up spider silk. And I agree, he's probably using some synthetic. But because we do not know the exact composition of that synthetic, we don't want to guess and make even more assumptions than we have to make. Oh, that's, don't worry, that's probably fine. Spiders actually have a number of different spider silks. You do not even have to give them weird properties. They have an, that's good, right? <laughs> it should be fine. Spiders have prey capture silk, prey immobilization silk, reproduction silk, dispersal silk, a source of food silk, guidelines, alarm lines, pheromonal trail lines. They have a number of different kinds of spider silks. Now considering that spider silks come in so many different varieties, I think we can use all the engineering properties for spider silk and go with those rather than just speculating on everything to do with Peter Parker's special blend of spider dope. That's what it's called because it is. So that's why I did what I did. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode out wherever I am, I have to give to Timur Shaw, frequent commenter, who says, does one need to take into consideration how long after Peter Parker shot the web when it, re when it reached Gwen? Well, after making some assumptions, the fastest spider silk production is 400 millimeters per second. So at that rate, it would take a spider 120 hours to produce enough silk to save Gwen Stacy. Don't you think that's a problem? A few of you pointed this out, that don't we have to take into consideration how fast the web travels. I was assuming that the web just catches her at the halfway point or wherever it catches her because that's what happens. But not all spiders are that slow at producing silk. The spitting spider can shoot webs out at 28 meters per second. Highway speed. And how quickly was Gwen Stacy falling when Spider-Man caught her in our scenario? 25, 26 meters per second. So I think there is some wiggle room here where the web can travel fast enough to catch Gwen Stacy before she even reaches the end point and it can start stretching. I think that still works, but for you looking up all those numbers and making me think about how quickly spider silk comes out of their butts, spinnerets more technically, you, Tim or Shaw, are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> oh, I gotta check on something. Okay, I think we're good now. Something involving 
a lot of blowy uppy stuff. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be. And if you're subscribed to Alpha, you already know why I'm on this incredible spaceship. It's because you are watching Orbital Redux, a live sci-fi show, an, an opera, if you will, with the voice of Spider-Man himself, Yuri Lowenthal, which is fitting for this episode. It's 10 cameras, cut live, it looks amazing. You should definitely watch it and subscribe to Alpha. But if you're not subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is which starting Pokemon is the most powerful? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are going all the way back to generation one to help settle an eternal nerd debate. Which starter Pokemon is really the strongest? Charizard, Venusaur, or Blastoise? Ignoring all of the other stuff that's in game, like effectiveness and resistances and how easy it is to get through the starting levels, just looking at real world applications of their powers, which one would you choose? I'm sure no one will have any issues with my analysis. So go back and watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about the death, or so you think, of Gwen Stacy, and leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Also, just before I go, I have to shout out the 1,500 young men, the 1,500 young women, and all the volunteers and all of their teachers that I spoke to at San Antonio's STEM Day uh, over two days put on by the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce there. It was absolutely fantastic. All the students were amazing. And if any of you are watching, if any of you do want to go into STEM, I am positive. If you put your minds to it, you can blow all of ours. And don't forget, just like I try to tell all those young men and women in San Antonio, science is for everyone. The great thing about the progressive body of knowledge that is science is that if we all use the same methods, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your sex, what your gender is, where you live, how much money you make, who your parents are, or even when you live. If we all follow the same methods, we can find the same amazing answers about our universe. And if you think that you are not the kind of person who should go into science, you are exactly the kind of person that we need. Oh, <laughs> I'll see you in a bit.